All right, well, I've got just about 635. So why don't we go ahead and get started? Um, hello, everyone. My name is Alex Tarantino. I'm PDI's Kent County Vice President and the Chair of the Education Committee. I want to welcome you all to the second installment in the Historic Preservation Webinar Series. Tonight's webinar is called The Restoration of Poplar Hall, presented by Greg Shelton, who's one of our PDI board members. So we're very excited to have Greg here tonight to tell us a little about his experience restoring his 18th century home and farm in Pencater 100, Newcastle County. So before I introduce Greg, just a few reminders. All attendees are muted. So if you have a question, uh, we encourage you to use the Q&A function that's located at the bottom of your screen. And don't worry if your question isn't answered right away. I'll be keeping track of all questions and comments received, and we'll have plenty of time after Greg's presentation for questions. Um, you can also use the chat box to get in touch with us um, or if you're having technical difficulties. And I also wanted to let you all know that this workshop is being recorded and it'll be available in a few weeks on Preservation Delaware's YouTube channel. After the workshop, we'll have a short survey that'll pop up for you all. So if you wouldn't mind taking a minute to fill it out and submit, and lastly, if you aren't already a member of PDI, please consider joining and or donating. Your support helps us keep events like this one free. So we'll post more info in the chat. So tonight our presenter is Greg Shelton. Uh, so Greg and his family live at Poplar Hall, which is an 18th century house and farm that's listed on the National Register of Historic Places. So Greg found the property in 2004. Um, it was very overgrown, uh, getting ready to be destroyed by the elements and forgotten by a developer focusing solely on building brand new construction. But with the help of his late father, Greg adjusted his life to bring it back to its Georgian grandeur. And since 2004, this, the farm has seen the construction of a large English hedged kitchen garden, several European Christmas markets, weddings, and many family events. So Greg is, as I mentioned, is one of our PDI board members, um, but he's spent a large part of his career in the marketing world. He owns his own agency where he focuses on marketing and brand experiences and eventing in the tri-state area. And so I'm especially looking forward to Greg's presentation tonight. Uh, when I started grad school at UD in 2012, Poplar Hall was actually one of the first properties um, that I had the privilege of documenting and researching as a as a part of the Center for Historic Architecture and Design. So it holds a special place in, in my heart. Um, Greg and his wife Dawn were so welcoming and gracious during our time there. So I can say firsthand just how passionate they are about Poplar Hall. Um, I think, as we all know, owning and maintaining a historic home is not an easy task, but I think Greg and his family are a great example of how it's possible to invest in our historic resources and preserve them for many years to come. So uh, welcome, Greg, and thanks so much for being here tonight. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I'm looking forward to telling my story as scary and good as it is. Um, when I think about even delivering that, that presentation, I get goosebumps thinking about it because it was a little scary. Anyway, so it's good. So I'm gonna share my screen if that's okay. Excuse me guys giving it away here. Okay, I hope everyone can hear me fine. If they can't, please let Alex uh, and Tim know. Uh, again, my name is Greg Shelton. I was born and raised in Chesapeake City, Maryland. Uh, I live in Poplar Hall now, which is right over the Maryland Delaware line on the back of Chesapeake City. It is in Pencater 100, which is considered Newark, Delaware. I have no idea how that happened, but it's, uh, but it's all good. So I really wanted to give you a background on what it was like to find a historic house, because there's only so many of them out there. I hate, hate to tell everybody, but a farmhouse um, in, in, in our area in Delaware uh, a lot of times they're not saved by the owner or the, or the developer that wants to come in and make changes. Um, I believe, uh, as I learned, you know, 18 years ago, um, that it's everyone's job to figure that out. And I, I really believe if you're a Delawarean, it's your, it's your duty 
to dig into these houses to figure out what they have, why they're still standing, and what the value is. So let me go into my story. Um, I do want to tell you that I believe that Poplar Hall, of course, is a piece of Delaware's 18th century history. And we talk about that being, uh, you know, the house is really dated back to the mid 18th century, um, although 1780 is the time frame that we're really working with. So I hope you enjoy it, and I look forward to hearing your feedback. So here's Poplar Hall. Uh, it's it's kind, of, kind of a watercolor picture. Uh, it's an aerial shot my, my wonderful nephew took with a drone. Uh, it's a picture that I've had for a long time, and I absolutely love it. And it's something that I use to denote the house whenever I can because it just says so much because Poplar Hall is a very peculiar house uh, in the Pencater 100 because it has a Pennsylvania style to it, even though it's, it's nestled right in the area, which would be considered you know, Delaware into Maryland. So it's, um, it's a wonderful home, no matter how scary I get in this presentation, no matter how funny or laugh or joke about it, um, this is the house that my family will live in uh, for, for as many years as we're on the planet. So to me, um, I didn't think about that when I first took this project on, but I can say now it's a place that, that uh, we're happy to live in for the rest of our lives. So I wanna give you guys an idea of what we're really going to cover in this presentation. Um, the, the map on the right side, as you can see, there's a denotation of Poplar Hall. Below that, you'll see a J. Bolden. Now, if, anyone, if I have any Maryland friends that are on the, on the line today, the Bolden family is everywhere in Maryland. There's loads and loads and loads of Boldens. And uh, the Bolden family, <clears throat> uh, the home was built by James Bolden, what we call James Bolden the Elder, which was the father. Um, his, his, you know, he came over as one of the first family members uh, from England into Virginia area and then into Maryland. So he is the one that built Poplar Hall, and uh, it was a pleasure researching everything about him. But I want to give you an idea without going too, too far off topic. So the first one's Poplar Hall found us. A lot of times you, people go nowadays, young couples go and they go and they look through a magazine or online and they go to, they go to a, you know, a website and they find the home. Honey, it's the colors that we want. It's the size we want. Um, a historic house does none of those things. Um, it's really a feeling in your gut when you go see it and you see the structure, you go into the basement and all you see is dirt. You don't see a bricks or a floor. Um, it's, it's the love of the area that you're in that's important. We love it. Now what? Oh, damn. What are we going to do now? We've fallen in love with this house. We can't get it out of our systems. How in the hell are we going to get this thing moving in case the guy doesn't want to sell it? I'll get into that in a second. The dream dies, da, 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 da. or did it? The deal, aka risky business. I'll just tell you that this deal was not, a, uh, not an easy thing to stomach. Um, it was really on the backs of our passion to have the house that made it happen. And if anyone who's worked hard for something, you'll know exactly what I mean. The work begins. That's when we, that's when we roll up our sleeves and say, we're going to get this damn thing done. We're going to live in it, and we're going to love it. Um, goodbye closing, hello historic home. That means that we've closed and we're in and we're ready to build our life here. Changes for good is really the idea that we're that we're going to be making changes that uh, if anyone knows me, they know that I'm a super duper researcher. Um, I rarely go into something that I'm not full bore on. And the research that we did, honestly, thanks to Michael and Alex and people like that, uh, that supplied their efforts, that's what helped us get there. Um, historically remarked, that's really uh, the idea that we received historic markers and then the Chad group and, and Alex mentioned earlier, they came, they swooped in and did some great things and we made some great friends out of it and, I, and I'm really happy there. A brand, could Poplar Hall, being a marketing nerd that I am, could Poplar Hall be something that's bigger than just a house or bigger than just Greg Shelton and together could we do something great, not good? And that's really something that I live by. Um, history loves company, and you can do it too. And I want to sh I want to show you at the end why I think it's doable, why it's worth your time to consider. And then it's uh, hopefully around the 17, 715 time frame that we're going to go into questions. And uh, no question is off 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 limits. I, I I hope that you ask anything that you feel like you want to know, and I will surely make any contact information for myself available in case you'd like to reach out. Okay. Okay. So Poplar Hall found us. Why a historic house? My wife Dawn and I didn't have kids. 
We bought our first house near the water. Uh, it was an acre of land on it. It was a ranch home. It was our first home. Uh, we loved it. That's cat. Um, we love the house. Um, I was raised on a farm in Chesapeake City, Maryland. And um, for me, I was used to a lot of land and an acre was fine by me, but the house wasn't exactly architecturally something that really, hold on guys, I have a Siamese cat. Oh. All right, sorry about that. I have a partner for the rest of the show. So um, so we, we lived there for about three years and then uh, my wife uh, has a dog grooming business. Her mother has a really large kennel in the Bear area. And when my wife was going to work, there was a girl that worked for her, for his mother. And um, she always talked about living in this brick mansion house that was tucked away on Denny Road. Well, I didn't think anything about it. Um, and she told us that she lived in half of the house. And I, it just sounded like it was a kind of a dusty experience. And it, was, it wasn't something that I was interested in, in kind of jumping in with. Um, and then all of a sudden she had an Afghan hound by the name of Aisha um, and she couldn't keep the dog anymore. So my wife Dawn said, hey, we'll take the dog. So we met, we met up with her. We picked up dog, the dog and she mentioned, you guys got to go find that house. I took the dog home. The next day we said, we're going to go find this house and see what's, what it's about. I drove down Denny Road and all of a sudden I pull in this, this pebble driveway and the trees were growing onto the ground. There were structures everywhere. The driveway was full of weeds. Uh, you couldn't see a walkway. The fence was rotten. Uh, and I'm like, what in the hell? Where are we? Um, but then I lifted up the umbrella of everything. And there was a Flemish bond brick structure with a fieldstone addition that I never knew was here. And I'm literally two minutes, two to three minutes from my parents' house where I was raised and I never saw this house in my life. So I was like, oh my gosh, I went through the house, looked at the structure, kind of scary, a, a lot scary, but I started walking back and forth in the driveway, you know, trying, kind of thinking about this. And, I, and then Dawn went back to the car and I said, Dawn, we've got to find a way to get this house, not anybody else's house, we have to get this house. So we went home, we talked about it forever, and the next day I didn't tell Dawn, but I went to my, come on Travis. Excuse me, guys. So I went, uh, I secretly went to my parents' house. My mom was out on the deck. My dad was inside the house. And I said to mom, I was kind of laughing. I said, mom, I need you to get in the car with me because I want to take you to a house that I found that's close to, to, to your house. Uh, but it's, um, it's really, it, it, it's like another world. It's truly amazing. So she gets in the car and she's kind of giggling. And I said, she goes, where, where is it? Is it on, she goes, is it on Denny Road? And I said, yeah, I believe so. She goes, and she grabbed me by the arm and she said, she used to call me Gregory. She says, Gregory, I've always loved this house. We would use that road to go up to Christiana and I've always, always, always loved that house. And of course I got feeling warm inside thinking, okay, your mom likes it, how can you go wrong? So we go through the house, we, we pulled in, we were giggling to each other, mom had shorts on and there's weeds everywhere. So we go in, we, we, we turn the doorknob, then the door opens. And I'm like, oh, damn. So we started to walk through the house. And then we end up in the drawing room, which is where I am now. Where I am now. And um, we started looking and we just started feeling giddy, just laughing about how amazing the, win the windows are huge. And the, the floors are amazing. Just random with flooring, just beautiful stuff, uh, albeit wet and damp and crappy looking. So then we go out the back door thinking we own the joint. Then all of a sudden, this... 250 pound farmer yells at us, what are you doing here? Scared the hell out of both of us. And I just looked at him and I just begged for forgiveness. I thought he owned the house. I said, sir, I am very sorry. Uh, we should not have been in here. I apologize. I, I was able to calm him down. Long story short, we became friends and he and I said, sir, I would just like to know who owns the house because I would like to see if they'll be willing to sell it. He did give me the name. It was a gentleman, uh, a business development gentleman uh, up in Wilmington uh, who owns the Hercules building. And uh, he gave me his contact information. And then after that, I was so damn excited. I secretly went back and, and, and dropped mom off. And I went into the house and said, dad, I got to show you a house. So when I picked dad up, did the same thing, didn't tell him I took mom there already. And I showed dad the house and I said, dad, do you think we could do it? 
and dad was retiring at the time. And he said, Greg, this house is still, the bones are so strong here. If you can get the barns and the property, the house, um, because it was a 180, 180 acre farm, um, I think it's worth it and we can, we'll, we'll jump into it. I was just so damn excited. I just couldn't believe it. So that was the impetus of us to get to, get to the next level. And that's kind of where we were. We're just so excited um, that this was the house. Now, here's what we saw when we started to, to kind of see what this was there. A fence that was dilapidated. Every shrub was grown there. It was, it was completely vacant for eight to nine years. Um, it was just, it was terrible. It was just, I, most people would have ran like the, ran for the hills. I almost did. Um, just a lot of bad design issues. Uh, a lot of just old, old stuff going on here. And it was, it was scary. But you could see, if you look at that field stone and you look at the brick, um, it, the, it, it had the bones of a champion. And that's what makes me so damn excited to even talk about it. But you can see, so overgrown. Most people drove by, didn't even know that the house even existed. Another horrible, a horrible picture. Uh, great picture, Greg. Uh, and this is, this is a picture right by the road. So you can see um, a lot of people that, that now come to me and say, I remember when that, that guy who bought that house he let it go. He let it go to, to disrepair, and I can't believe he did that because everyone loved this house. They would drive on the road just to see it. So these are the these are the the ugly truth of what it's like to jump over the hoops to get to a historic house. But I can assure you, it's more than worth it. Another awful picture: uh, Victorian farmhouse porch. Both of the porches were really, really, really in bad shape. Uh, I didn't like them anyway, so it's all good. Uh, oh my gosh, there's cows. So the gentleman that the the, Sco the, the Scooby Doo guy that came and tried to kick us off the property, it turns out that he was the farmer up the street that owns the Land of Lakes Dairy Farm, and he was the caretaker of this property. So he would put his hay and straw in the barns. He used most of the acreage to keep his cows there, and uh, he turned out to be a really really nice gentleman. But at the beginning, he was uh, not not a nice customer. So you can see. Dairy barn. This was a dairy farm that for the, the historical registry shows that the, the Denny family had a dairy barn there, which is where De Denny Road comes from. And the driveway uh, was just really, really bad shape. So we know it's bad shape. This is the inside when we first started to look at it. You can see the, the wall, the floors are uh, multi sized planked uh, heart pine floors. They were painted a chocolate brown, which was awful. Wallpaper on the walls, a uh, beautiful marble mantle that I Pretty much never seen one before. I, I know it wasn't original to the house, but beautiful nonetheless. It's still in the house, and we when we do love it. Um, the top right picture was in our foyer uh, towards the back of the house. Um, love the uh, the the rose appliques there. Uh, needs to say they were the first thing to go. But if you look up, you see a really rotten hole. That was from renters that that had a bathroom up above that, and they just let it drip and drip and drip, and it just fell right down. The bottom picture, it was a makeshift kitchen that was in here because what I found really interesting about Poplar Hall was not only did the brick and the stone denote a different time frame in the history of the house, being the brick was the original part of the house. Everyone thinks the stone is original, but the brick Georgian home was the 18th century home. In the early 1800s, 1820, 1830, uh, it was in vogue to dismantle a cooking kitchen, which was Fieldstone, and they connected it to the house, and they opened up doorways to take care of the kids, and then one in the basement where the walk-in uh, walk fireplace is. So it was, um, it was, needless to say, two families lived in both sides. So when we first found the house, in the kitchen, the, the doorways were boarded up. They had they had uh, all kinds of furniture in front of them, and, and it was just crazy. And I'm thinking, how in the hell? Um, and there's, they had two addresses with the house, so um, so it was just it was just really crazy. And um, I just I just found it very very interesting. So anyway, so we we love the house, so beautiful. Um, now what are we going to do? So my wife and I went home every single night. We met up. We would meet up in Chesapeake City. I would come home from Wilmington. We go have dinner in Chesapeake City, and every single night we talk about this house. What 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 can we do? What are we going to do? Uh, Mom and Dad like it. Uh, we think we can fix it, but we don't. We haven't heard from the owners. Um, they didn't care that we were there, so it was just um, essentially a black box, which kind of stinks. 
So what I ended up doing was really spending my time to make the right decision. Um, I just started to go online and learn as much as I could about this property because I said to myself, if we end up a situation where, where people, where, where they're willing to sell it, I needed to be ready. I needed to have a plan and I wanted to make sure I didn't let my dad down and I didn't let my wife and, and, and my family down. So we made sure I did as much research as I can. And that also was incredibly fun. So I went down to Dover and I started to look at maps and I looked at anything I could find. And I found the nomination uh, for the National Registry of Historic Places form. And I found out that in 1988, it was added as a national landmark of historic places in the United States. It was in, in fact, formerly known as Poplar Hall, which was great to know that was correct. And um, it was incredibly cool to see maps of something as old as 1868 with the idea that Poplar Hall is written uh, on there. And I think that's important to, to, to remember. And this picture at the, at the lower right is a picture that was in the nomination. And although that picture is uh, black and white, it looks, it's from, like, it looks like it's from the 50s or something, that was actually 1988 or 87. Uh, it just looks a lot older. But I have to say this picture here I get nervous thinking about it, was, was really a picture that I looked at so many times because I realized all these overgrown rhododendrons and all these hall and ivy growing up this and weeds growing there, if I get rid of all of that, if I can bring it back to what I'm seeing here, then I know, I know we have something that no one else has. And uh, being a little bit of a marketing branding nerd, I've always been a type of guy of look, looking for something that's original and different. And that's something I, I pride myself on. And I, we, we, were, we were on the fringe of something really great, or it could have been an absolute <laughs> disaster and a failure if you didn't want to sell it or if we weren't prepared. Um, but anyway, so another picture here, which I think is a great one. This is also from the nomination of the film, film work that the team did to put it on the, uh, on the registry. Um, I think it's interesting if you notice that there's a kind of a, uh, a farmhouse Victorian porch on the on the back. Um, you will see a lot of pictures during this presentation, and you know a Georgian home of this time frame. The back of the house and the front of the house are so uh, so structurally sound, and you know the things that a Georgian home has is everything's very symmetrical. So a lot of times you don't know what the back or the front is, which is why. People drive into our home and it's the back. This is actually the front, sorry. This is actually the front. And the one thing I wanted to, to point out to everybody, um, although it, it's treated this way, is that um, the porch, which I will show you in another, another picture, um, everything is incredibly symmetrical and so stunning um, that I just, this is another picture that I would look at relentlessly and, and try to figure out like, what were they thinking? Why did they put the porch on? And how many gardens are they planting? And it just, it was just um, just an amazing picture and something that I always think about when I when I look at there. So um, this is just a little side note that I pulled out of the National Registry. Um, the a, a couple of really interesting things about the Bolden family without going too far into it. But uh, this page talks about um, slaves and and how how the family worked and they, what they ended up doing was they were one of the first families in Delaware to release to release their slaves willingly. And to me, it was something that I, I read and I remember highlighting a lot of these interesting notes um, to me was just so incredibly valuable and something, like I said earlier, that I wanted to make sure that I was a part of this house no matter what happened. All right, so this is this little plot plan here is really, really interesting because a lot of people who see Poplar Hall or come into it, when I tell them that it's an 18th century house, mid 18th century, the windows are incredibly large for this house. Most of the most of the Georgian, you know, kind of colonial federal houses, they have uh, you know smaller windows, uh, and we have six by six, six over six as far as the the panes in the windows. And a lot of those homes you'll see a lot more panes. But from our house and our perspective, um, this house on the National Registry, as you can see. Um, it started off as a normal Georgian home, and they expanded it. So if you look at the, the top, uh, the, excuse me, the second graphic, where it says the first floor reconstructed, um, 
they had corner fireplaces in what we consider the kitchen. The kitchen was a two room, initially a two room um, area, uh, two, two rooms in the area. And then it had diagonal fireplaces. And what they end up doing was they end up getting rid of the wall. And, I, and this was really an expansion movement. So as you can see to, to this Bolden family, man, size really matters to these guys because I, I'm 6'1". I can stand in the windows in the living room in the kitchen. That's how big they are. Um, so it was really interesting to learn these things. And when, and when I dipped my feet in the, into, the, into the river here, I started to really get involved in understanding the, the, the print work that these guys did for me to understand uh, bearing walls and understanding what's in the basement. And it was really, really, really rewarding to get this documentation. So Poplar Hall, on the National Registry, the word peculiar is mentioned many times. Uh, when I read it, I didn't like the idea of peculiar because I was thinking that must sound like a strange, like they can't figure out what it is. Um, but now that I own the house and farm and, and uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm just loving life, um, it, it helps me singular understand that this is, this is a different style house. So I highlight the idea that you have a field stone addition connected but right up to the brick, uh, to the brick structure, which uh, in Pennsylvania, you see this, this is just not, doesn't seem to be a Delaware thing or really a Maryland thing to what I've seen. Um, it's, it's, um, it's just very, very peculiar. And um, I just, I just love it. It's, it's different. And you don't see many houses that way. Another thing uh, that I think is very interesting in the, um, in the Greek revival period, 1820s, 1830s, the house was given to, to uh, James Bolden II, or Junior, and um, he was a very, very wealthy farmer, did incredibly well in his business, and he's the one who overhauled Poplar Hall to be pretty much bragging rights for a house this size. Now, the two bottom pictures are from, from you know, relatively new, um, but you can see the one on the left is from the drawing room or the living room. We have straight columns up the side, recessed panels in all of the, all of the window jams. Um, and the right picture still has the same paneling in the door frames as the whole house has internal paneling in the doorways. But it has a very, very bizarre uh, framework around, surround around the door, around the doorway. Um, the National Registry puts it as Egyptian revival, which again, the word peculiar and Egyptian revival kind of go hand in hand, I'm assuming when it comes to architecture, because I've never heard of anything called uh, Egyptian revival until I started doing my homework. So if, if uh, unfortunately, I didn't put a full picture, but the sides go small and they get bigger a little bit. And then you can see that the top cap or the, or the pediment just has a little taper to the top. Very strange, but still incredibly stately and still beautiful. The um, the picture in the purple is very strange. I'm, I'm sure you're thinking, what in the hell is this? This is a three-story house in the attic, which is an amazing attic, by the way. They retain the original molding to the house. Can you look at the difference? Um, it's a gray stain or, or come with like a great wash paint of some sort. Um, and you can tell when you dig into it, they're really, it's, it's the same paint it was originally because there's no other paint on it. And it's very, you know, I guess, I'm assuming it's more federal, maybe Georgian style. Um, but it's a chair rail that goes all the way up this, the third story steps. And um, the, um, the attic in the National Registry, um, it, it was also a slave quarters for them because the attic is all whitewashed. And, um, and they took care of everything up there. So uh, the National Registry folks uh, seem to think that they, they housed uh, before the Fieldstone uh, quarters were built. That's where they, that's where they stayed uh, and survived up there. Okay, Louise Conway Belden. I'm sure you're like, what is this? So um, why we, while we were researching the house, uh, Mr. McConnell mentioned to me about a woman named Louise Belden. And the story goes, uh, he, she was married to a gentleman by the name of Gail Belden, who were very wealthy people up in Wilmington, Delaware. And it turns out that they owned Poplar Hall for almost 50 years. Uh, I think they bought it maybe in the 20s, something along those lines, maybe the 30s. And um, they owned the 180 house and 180 acre farm with it, but they never ever lived here. Now, Mrs. Belden was the first female and maybe the first curator at Wintertour. So she's a very, very learned woman. She so, was so incredibly smart. 
Uh, we spent a lot of time with her. We brought her back to the house many times. We went to dinner with her a lot. And it was just, she was just a wealth of knowledge. And um, she was a Wellesley grad. She traveled the world before she left college. Um, she was really like an Amelia Earhart, just a pleasure to be a friend with and just so amazing. She was a writer. She wrote The Festive Tradition. Uh, she autographed a copy of that for us, which I thought was very cool. And then next to that is a, is a book called The Marks of American Silversmiths. Now, that's a strange book. It's, it's super thick. And I'll never forget when I first met her, she lived alone at Kendall at Longwood in Kennett Square, a, a kind of a wealthy retirement uh, home. And um, she had her own house there. And I walked in the door with my wife and I was kind of nervous because I, you know, I just I wanted to make sure she knew that we were going to try to take care of the house in case we got it. And um, and the first thing she said to me, um, she says, Greg, how much is that silversmith book going for on eBay these days? Now, first of all, she was in her 90s. And I said, and unfortunately, I was embarrassed because I actually looked it up. I actually knew it. That book went for a, a thousand and above if you want to. It's still incredibly a hard book to find. And it's normally in the five to a thousand dollars just to buy the book. Uh, it turns out that people all over the world use that book that she wrote because she uh, worked with, uh, I guess, Henry DuPont, if I'm not mistaken. And she was told to put hallmarks on all of the uh, Innocent Bissell collection. So people use that to rate their, their silver all over the world. So she, um, she was just a wealth of knowledge. I was, uh, Dawn and I were so excited to call her a friend. Um, she lived till she was 103, I believe. And um, one funny story, and I always remember this, and uh, I tried to talk my way out of it, it just didn't work, but she came to the house one of the times and in the back of the house, we planted a lot of English boxwoods because I, you know, early on, I thought that's kind of what you do for homes like this. And you kind of do, but you have to have a little bit of a plan. Well, um, I didn't, uh, she didn't tell me this. I heard, I, I heard this from her caretaker later, 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 but she was pissed uh, that I put boxwoods up against the house because she said, I can't believe Greg wanted to do that. A wealthy estates like that would never have boxwoods up against their house. It would cause termites. It could cause water damage. And they never did it. And she was always mad at me for that. And, I, and the only thing, I, the saving grace was, and my talk off, was that uh, I said, Mrs. Belden, uh, I heard that you don't like what we did. Um, but the back of the house, which is actually the front, and then eventually we will put a driveway in front, we didn't have any shrubs there at all. So I kind of felt like I met, I met her midway. We did what we had to do. So I thought that was pretty Pretty darn cool. Okay, now I have to let everybody down because um, I, I was uh, so excited about um, this house. I did a lot of legwork. I did a lot of research. I had a great time, lost a lot of sleep, uh, became an incredibly infatuated. And then I thought to myself, what if I call this guy and he truly never gets back to me? Like it's just falls on deaf ears. He doesn't want to sell it. He's going to tear it down, whatever. Um, I was always nervous about that. So that went through my head many, many, many times. So what I did was I called him. I called him incessantly. I called his cell phone. I called his home phone. I even accidentally found his wife's cell phone, didn't know it was hers. And I called and I spoke to a woman and said, hey, may I speak to Paul McConnell? He's not here. And, uh, and she, knew, she knew who it was. And uh, months, months and months went by. We never heard from him. And uh, we were pretty devastated. And, it, and I felt like, man, I, I made the wrong decision. I should have never put us in that, in that, in that situation. I screwed that up. And, uh, and I was just like, gosh, darn it. And uh, anyway, so we, we, uh, we pivoted. And I said, you know what? We have a beautiful house where we're living. We're going to build off of that. We're going to get a boat. And we're going to turn into Maryland boaters. We're going to be great. We're going to get a sailboat, something. We're going we're gonna to kind of re, uh, we're gonna pivot and re reintroduce ourselves and kick this Georgian thing out the idea. So all of a sudden, I think four months later, my phone rings, I answer it. And the gentleman says, is this Greg Shelton? I said, yeah, absolutely. And he said, this is, uh, this is Paul McConnell. Uh, I got your name because I heard you're interested in the house. And I'm like, oh, wow. Okay, so uh, I was freaking out because I'm like, oh my gosh, I wrote this whole thing off. This is, this is just not possible. So uh, without beleaguering this whole thing, I won't go too much farther into it, but I was excited and scared and nervous and it was crazy. So we got the call. 
And then later, I have to tell you, um, after we got through this and, we, and, and, and the story gets better, he ended up giving me this memo that was in my file with him about the house. And it was the actual sheet that his secretary finally gave him that says to Paul from Greg Shelton, regarding the Denny, Denny Road home, he's wondering if you'd be interested in selling it. So he did get back to me and we started having meetings and I put my tie on and I rolled up to Wilmington went into his offices and we sat down and I was passionate and I was just energized and he saw that and he respected it. And then I told him what I wanted to do. And I told him that my family's into it. And I, I said, let's, let's, I, I want to do it. And, uh, but there's some pitfalls. I have to sell my house and a lot of things. That, the house is not even livable, nowhere near livable. So anyway, so we decided that we were going to do it and then it gets really exciting. So from that discussion, probably six months after that, we end up signing a risky business plan that was considered nowadays as a lease to purchase. And sent, I get, you know, I shiver to think about this now. If I had my son who says, Dad, if Alex says, Dad, I want to go into lease purchase, I'm going, like, Jesus, please don't do it. But what we did was we locked, it was, it was a buyer's market at the time, excuse me, a seller's market at the time. So um, we agreed to the price of the house. It was certainly uh, you know, a, a great deal for, for me, um, but it was, it was going to entail a lot of work. And um, the idea that if you really look at the risky business of this uh, arrangement, we signed a contract on the price of the house with the idea that we will work on it, rehab it, make it livable, and then we have to go to close it. So, We've got to show that we can get the loan. We've got to fix it up so it's it's a house that can be that doesn't have to spend a lot of money in ten to twenty to fifteen years that we'll have to put back into it after we've already fixed it up. So a lot of things are running through my mind. I'm like freaking out, but I'm like we're doing it. So we signed the document. Uh, it's probably the most energetic I've ever been uh, because it was just such a crazy situation. Um, but I've I've unfortunately have lost both my mom and dad. Um, and I think about them all the time because they had faith in me. <clears throat> they had faith in me to try something that was not the smartest thing in the world to do. But they trusted me and they, and they respected my wishes and what I wanted to do. And I respected the hell of, of their support. Um, and without that, um, I wouldn't have been anything. And I just uh, I wish they were here to see the presentation because I think they would laugh with me about it. But um, it is what it is. So the next day, I made uh, some serious decisions. I'm contract. My wife and I are contractually bound to do something with this house. And I'll be very first. I'm first one to admit, um, I'm not a. I'm not a super duper handy guy. I can get by and I can do some things. I can wheel tools. Uh, I can take some motorcycle engines apart here and there, but nothing really big. Um, so I said to my dad, I said, dad, I will come here every single day after work. I, uh, I ran a marketing team at ING Direct. So I was in the uh, banking sector. And every day after I came home from work, I would come home. I would pull horsehair plaster down. I would scrape up floors. I would rip paint off of stuff. I would cut down stuff. So what I had to do when I was off, um, I would help my dad on the weekends and then sometimes at night. And when he would leave, that's when I could do landscaping stuff because he didn't like that stuff so for me it was just like okay dad's leaving okay get out the hedger you know get out the the bushwhacker i'm gonna i'm gonna start taking stuff down so i worked my ass off every single night uh, but we made movement so we got rid of everything that was in the house loads of renters galore left all their stuff there but we we got we we, we started to get it out and we started to see a little bit of light as you can see on that bottom picture a little light started to shine on this house um, I, I removed the lattice work and the screen off the porch so you could see the house. I started, I obviously cut the grass so we could start to see green grass. You have these kind of like, um, you know, denoted green, green shutters, which is of the times. Um, but if you really look at that picture and I ask you to kind of look at your phone close, or if you have a, a regular desktop, expand that a little bit. Because I will agree, if you look through those pillars, you're immediately going to get slapped in the face 
with some mint green 70s paint. Unfortunately, a renter somewhere along the lines so of 70 years of renting, whatever, they painted the inside of what was a porch, because this again is on the back of the house, although it's the front, they use it as like a sunroom. So they wanted that mint green to make them feel, I guess, that they're at the beach or I don't know what the heck that's about. But they used a gypsum mixed paint with almost like a sandy, if there was sand in the paint. And it was ungodly. It bonded with the brick. Um, it, was, it was awful. Um, I had to have a team come and sandblast it off. Um, it did get rid of it because um, I had to get rid of it because it was so awful looking. But um, word to the wise, in case you want to do this, do more research on how you can get paint off of, of bricks. Please don't listen to me and get a sandblaster immediately. Encourage yourself to do your diligence and see if you can find someone who either can chemically remove it better uh, or something along those lines. Because I um, I would have probably done something different. But anyway, we got the green paint on. So the other side of the house. So you, you still have a rotten fence. But again, you're starting to see uh, a Georgian house again. You're starting to see, okay, this, this could be something, right? Well, not quite, but anyway, so on the back of the house, this is me going back in the field and, um, you know, you can kind of see, like I said, you get that federal that Georgian style there that, that really almost, it almost looks like you're in the field of England, which again, made, made me excited. Okay, so that's the outside horror, horror film. Now we're going to go inside. This wall is on the stone side um, in front of a big walk-in fireplace. Um, it's what they use as kind of the kitchen for the renters there. And there was probably 20 layers of wallpaper there um, that we scraped off. And uh, as you look at the bottom, rotten floor again, because that was a renter's kitchen. And that's where the water went. Total disaster. Uh, damp, gross. It is what it is. Yikes. This picture on the right is my father, uh, John Shelton, is in the foyer looking up through which was a sitting area uh, at the top of the step for normal Georgian homes that somewhere along the line they turned it into a bathroom which is great um, they let that water rot the floor so we we took the rotten stuff up and as you can see uh, dad and his pearly whites are staring up at what will be eventually a sink uh, and and a new bathroom that was a tough time I got to be honest okay I need some drink here. So now we are in what we call the kitchen, we, we consider the kitchen of our house now. It's really a, a, a formal dining room, but uh, since there was the, the walkways between the houses were boarded up, they made this, they made this a full scale kitchen, uh, which we still kind of have it today. But if I can attract your eye to the flooring, uh, it doesn't look, you know, it looks white. It doesn't look terrible. Uh, we already removed the wallpaper. As you can see, we were already starting to put a thin set on the walls. Um, but you can see the cabinets are junk. Uh, the mantle is very nice, um, but if you look at the thickness of that of that um, the flooring, um, it was about I would say three inches tall, just the flooring. And uh, I didn't think anything about it, but you know, my dad was my dad was home. I was here late in the day, and uh, I had a scraping tool. And my job for that night was to get the flooring up. And let's see what we got. So this was this just made me freak out. So I'll never forget, I take this tool, I jam it in, and I'm thinking, I got, a, I got a lot of grab on that. I'm going I'm to really do some damage here. And I use all my, my energy, I lift it up, and I'm thinking a big, massive board's going to come up, and it just ripped through all of it. And I'm sitting there looking at the, I'm looking at the tool, I'm like, oh my God, that's how wet and, and gross it was. It was so hard because all it was, was there was the, the normal floorboards, and they just put Luan, linoleum, Luan, linoleum, nails, Luan, all oh, build up loads of times. So uh, it was damp. So it was so old. It just took me a week to get that off. Anyway, so I got it off. Good for me. Uh, aren't I lucky? And this is what I found. And you can look at my dad's uh, face. <sighs> dad's like, damn it. Uh, not what I was hoping but uh, he was an optimist, so he said, hey, we're going we're gonna to fix it. Don't worry about it. So it, of course, was rotten to the basement. And Poplar Hall, still to this day, has a dirt basement. There is no, there's some bricks down there, but it's still 
it's not concrete. Uh, it's, it's still dirt and brick. So we looked at it and I was like, oh my gosh, what are we gonna do? So uh, another view uh, all the way to the basement, um, just awful, just, just awful. Um, I'll never forget while dad and I were working on this part of the project, we had about four or five friends. We we're all going to go out to dinner and they wanted to see what the, what the progress was like. And Lord knows they had to come at this moment when some of the worst damage is being, is, is, is show, rearing its face. Uh, and I know they were like, what in the hell is Greg and Dawn getting themselves into? But you know, we were too far into it then. And we were, we were going to see it through. Okay, so this picture here, I'm on top of the refrigerator that was a piece of junk that was there just to get a great view of what we were really looking at. Now, this was a completely beautiful heart pine floor that was pre predominantly in that circular area, just rotten, it was just a complete mess. So long story short, my dad did some thinking about it. He did some touring of the facility. He went upstairs in the attic, he went in the basement. And dad said, he called me at work and said, Greg, I've got a plan. I think it's going to work for the kitchen. Let's try and do it. So dad being the coolest dad of all time, look what he did. So if you look at the dark edges and you look at the, the peach colored or the, the tan in the middle, my dad went up to the third story attic, which had massive pine boards up there. And he, we, I think we pulled four out. And he took them and got them milled. And he got them milled to match the sizes, the assorted sizes of the heart pine flooring. We put them down and we end up, and it gave me the idea of how am I gonna meld this together? So we end up sanding all the floors in Poplar Hall and we stained them with a, a dark cherry uh, walnut stain and polyurethane over that. And um, it, it made the difference because I've not had one person recognize that when they've come into our home. And um, that's a kudos to my father. And I don't know what I would have done. And, you know, most people would have just put some type of subflooring down and put some type of tile down. And um, my dad stuck to his guns. And gosh, I'm so happy he did because it made the difference. And um, it made the floor beautiful. And I, I appreciate all the work that he did for that portion. All right. So in that same kitchen, yikes. Um, we have, uh, we have 10 and a half foot ceilings in our house. Okay, so really high ceilings for a home that size and, and age. Um, as you can see, it's horsehair plaster, very sandy, very gritty. Um, but you can see, you know, hundreds of years, the, the plaster has settled and there was cracks in all the ceilings in the house. Um, you know, a great designer would probably figure out a way to patch that up and spackle it up to make it look artsy, uh, but we weren't really going for that. So we, dad again, housed a wonderful plan, worked with some guys. And what we ended up doing was patching that up and we ended up putting drywall with extra long screws and we put drywall over top the existing plaster and it covered it up and you cannot tell. Um, and it's just uh, one of those cool things that a cool dad can do. And uh, that's why I give it, give uh, major credit for him. If you look at above the mantle, you'll see a triangular half, a little quarter wall kind of thing on, on, a, on, a, on a strange angle there. A lot of people ask me what that is. And there's a reason why the cracking happened there. Um, I wish I had a polling tool. I would pull everybody to see what they thought. But if you looked at, if you remember, I showed you the initial diagram that the Historical Society put together before it was changed over to the Greek Revival period, that was the remnants of a wall. And that was where the corner fireplaces were. And that was a wall that uh, uh, delineated two rooms in that era. So for some reason, they left the initial corner wall, uh, maybe just to remind people that that was what it was back in the day. Okay, so in the drawing room, living room uh, area that I'm in right now, we had another problem, another bizarre problem. The ceilings were really cracked there. It was awful. Um, and the boards that were up there, as you can see on the top right, you have some real old pine boards, or, or maybe they're oak, um, as you can see. Uh, and then you see some new wood there. Um, really, what my father realized was the wood was so old that as it settles and morphs and changes and bends, it, it just will never keep uh, a plaster, uh, you know, a plaster ceiling good for a long time. 
Um, so what he did was we, we got new boards and we sistered them up to the existing boards, dropped them down about two to three inches, and then we put drywall to that. Uh, we did insulate it, of course, um, and that's, um, that's what we end up doing. And it worked like a charm. The lower picture with the recessed lighting, um, that's a newer picture. And you can see that the ceiling um, looks like looks brand new. And it was a great little moment that my dad came up with. And um, I was elated to have that because it does look beautiful. All right, next segment. Goodbye, closing. Hello, historic home. Hard work that paid off. Okay, so we go to closing. So a year and a couple months go by of hard at work, um, untrustworthy, scary work, albeit, but we worked hard and we got it to where it was livable. And it was early December when this was getting done. As you can see the Christmas uh, picture on our mantle, um, we were ready to move in and we really wanted to get moved in before Christmas, uh, even though closing was still about a month away. Um, we did and we moved in and uh, Dawn and myself, we had Christmas for both of our families in, uh, in the house and it was such a special moment. Um, all the fireplaces here work. We've maintained them incredibly well. We burn them like crazy. And although um, they're designed incredibly well, they do put out a good amount of heat um, we still use it for ambiance, but it's it's something you can't reproduce and we love it. So um, as you do when you move in, you 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 own the home. It's not it's not someone else's anymore. The work you did paid off. We got in the house, we signed the documents, we went to closing. Um, it's a Shelton house and we're elated, but now is some additional hard work. We fixed up Poplar Hall so it was livable. We made some good design choices, um, but nothing really truly English or early American. We just got the house living. Now, keep in mind, we put in brand new electricity in the whole house, plumbing throughout the whole house, refinished every floor and all the stairs in the house, fixed the ceilings in the house. Um, we end up having the windows reglazed and new storm wonders put on, which I don't go too far into that, but it's self-explanatory. So we put a lot of work into there, but there are not a lot of design choices going on. So what I ended up doing was, okay, I'm a Maryland guy, I'm from Chesapeake City. It's time to get completely immersed in the vernacular architectural language of Delaware, uh, Georgian homes and federal homes. So I end up getting and renting and buying every book that I can get my hands on. As you can see, these are George Bennett books. Um, and really, it's a really a, a little bit of a haphazard look at different types of molding in our area. But this, these books were incredibly valuable to help me date the house and uh, do my own research. So we did research on Delaware homes and who had houses in the 18th century. What, what in the heck was Pencater 100? What type of houses were here? How many brick houses were here? That kind of stuff. We also dove headfirst into the Bolden family. Now, the Bolden family, like I said in the beginning, were really immersed in the, in the Maryland area and in the Delaware area. But um, I really learned about how James Bolden came over uh, from England for the first time and settled in Virginia, then came into the Cecil County area, then ended up building Poplar Hall right on the, this Maryland-Delaware line. Um, the Bolden family were, were an amazing family. And another quick tidbit, which I think is really, really incredible, you know, the Bolden family built the house. It went through the complete Bolden family. It went through the Denny family, the Ford family. And believe it or not, the Shelton family are only the fourth family to own Poplar Hall and live in it. It's been rented. Uh, McCon Mr. McConnell had it. He rented it. The Beldens had it and they rented it. They never lived in it. So it's interesting to put a a name to an amazing legacy and again, proud to just say it. Like I said earlier, the Delaware architectural vernacular, incredibly important. Um, nothing makes me more angry than when someone uh, restores a house and doesn't take the time to learn what that house would have had or if they, or if they overdo it, uh, that drives me crazy because the, the literature is out there. That's what, the, that's what websites are for and nice people put out great information. You should do your due diligence. Um, trust me, it's incredibly fun, and um, I found it incredibly rewarding. So, Delaware, Maryland, Pennsylvania, so historic, uh, part of the 13 colonies, 
so incredibly rewarding to be from this area. Um, I started to look right in our backyard to figure out what, what, what did they do when they restored these amazing homes? Um, you know, you, you, um, you have the homes from Odessa. We went to Williamsburg many times. Uh, we went down to the Mount Harmon plantation, which is you know, in, near the water in Maryland. Um, and we went to Gunning Bedford's house. We toured that. We became members in, uh, in Odessa for the Historical Society, and we became members of, um, of uh, Mount Harmon. I thought that was our, something we needed to do to immerse ourselves the correct way. So the last one is Je Jessup's Tavern. Raise your hand if you love Jessup's Tavern, which I absolutely do. Um, we had a lot of beer and dinner there while we're learning about all everything else. And uh, that's a great place. And uh, I, I, I love Old Newcastle. And uh, it's great to know that Poplar Hall is of the same time frame, maybe even a little bit earlier than a lot of these homes. Um, and it's great to be on your own as opposed to being in a district. Uh, it's still incredibly rewarding. Okay, changes for good. So this, this is really design things. This is, this is not stuff that has to get done, but it's stuff to get, that needs to get done for you to feel like, hey, this is ours. So I always reminded myself, Poplar Hall is an 18th century. And, and back in the 18th century, you know, people were still living in one room huts. There, there, there was a, this was an absolute mansion at the time. It is still to this day. But in the you know, 1780s, 1750s, what a massive house this was. Um, the goal was always from day one to restore, um, but always respect the, the legacy of the house and make sure the work that was done to put this as a national landmark, that we always upheld that. And whenever when someone stops to see the house, we always open our doors and we make sure we talk to everybody that pulls in um, and they, they always get a warm note from us. And I, I just think that's, that's really, really important. And lastly, um, I wanted to always expand the name of the house and the footprint that it causes, uh, and always remember what the house stood for. And that's why, that's why I'm here today talking about it. Okay, so the first cosmetic thing that we decided to do was to take these porches off. So they were kind of, I don't know that it's called a Victorian farmhouse, but, it's, but, you, but they have a lot of them in, in farmhouses in our area that, that kind of broad four, four two bay, four, three bay, um, four pillar uh, porch. Um, they were wet. They were really bad shape anyway. So you can see we removed the, the, um, the back porch altogether and we got rid of it. And, and um, you can see it already starts to look really Georgian um, and it was the right move and it, and it made the difference. It really made the house pop and it made that Georgian architecture look simple, less lines, you know, symmetries there, uh, the strength of the house just rose up big time when I did. And then when we did that. Okay, so the other thing I thought was really, really important when I learned from Williamsburg and I learned from Odessa and a lot of other places like that was you don't get the bang for your buck with a Georgian house that's brick and stone if your landscaping doesn't match up really well with the house and the style of the house. And I'm not just talking about you know, digging and putting in boxes, boxwoods everywhere. Um, it was important to do stately size things that matches the stateliness and the estate level of the structure. So there were no little tiny, uh, little tiny little gardens. Everything was big because this house could hold it. And when we bought the house, we got close to seven acres, which is all we really needed. We didn't need the 180 acres. Um, so we were fine with what we have. We own the whole corner and all the way up, which is great. So the one thing I did was we, we thought about landscaping and we, and um, if you look at the left picture, you'll see some field stone or some, it looks like slates actually rock. I was walking around outside one day and I saw a little corner of a stone kind of poking its head out of the grass right in that area. So I just took a little, that same scraper that I pulled the lawn up with and I started to kind of dig around and I'm like digging, 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 scraping, scraping, scraping. Then all of a sudden, this field stone walkway starts to expose itself. And leaves for 10, 15 years were just dropping and it, it, it turned to mulch and grass grew over it. So the whole walkway was grown over 
and no one knew it even existed. And uh, I dig it up and it's not the most efficient thing. It's got some high rocks and the, and the, and the tulip poplar tree is lifting up with the roots and you know, it's problematic, but I, I kind of like bizarrely still like it the way it is. So top right picture, I immediately put in a massive boxwood hedge to create a garden there. Um, my dad always got, um, got mad at me because I was addicted to putting in shrubbery. I didn't, but it wasn't worried about flowers. I, I wanted to put in greenery, um, shrubbery everywhere I could. And I'll never forget, my dad got sick of hearing me complain about it. He says, uh, he says, Greg, you can't eat the damn shrubs. <laughs> and he was absolutely right. Um, so I decided, hey, listen, let's, 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 let's taper off from this. So what I ended up doing was, this was a massive rose garden at one time. Um, I had a lot of lavender in it. Um, and then after a while, I decided to do a kitchen garden out there. And, um, and it's, really been, it's really been beneficial. And it's one of the things that we get a lot of, a lot of people stop and asking about it and that kind of thing. But that's, these are the foundational plants that I think make the home worthy and make it stately and match the, the, the time that you spend on the outside. Okay, so Poplar Hall had six outbuildings uh, initially with the house. They all came with the sale of the house, and I worked hard to maintain all of them. Um, as you can see, they are painted black. Now, um, I will be the first one to say, uh, I don't actually care, but um, it's a polarizing color. Some people love it, some people hate it. Um, I like it because to me, um, a dairy farm, you know, most people will do a white barn to denote the dairy farm, or they'll paint it the, the quintessential red, red barn, which I don't like to be normal. Um, and I didn't want to compete with the brick of the home. I thought the brick and the stone were so beautiful, that should be the shining light. And I wanted our outbuildings to fall along the countryside and fit in with the grass. So they were either going to be a dark green or a black. And I thought, you know, black is a lot easier to get uh, five to six years from now. I don't have to worry about matching it. So I ended up going with black. I absolutely love it. And um, I like it because not many people have it. And it's just, it's just very, very cool. Um, it is a lot to care for a lot of extra outbuildings, but I'll show you uh, coming up that we utilize a lot of these buildings um, for, for experiences on the farm too. So the first interior overhaul, once we fixed everything, um, we, uh, our design taste uh, is really a neutral, uh, really a subdued style. Um, because to me, the windows are so big, there's so much natural light that comes in, um, and the moldings are so strong and heavy. Um, I believe that you don't need to hit some over the head with blue and you know big, huge crimson red and all this stuff. I want it to be very stately. I want it to be understated, but I want it to be very, very strong. So we went with neutrals in the house, um, and I think it really, it really makes the uh, the moldings pop just enough but it makes you feel like I can experience the house as opposed to having to have a frying pan hit, hit you over the head to say, hey, you know, I want to have really, really bright colors. We're not, we weren't about that. And that's something that we, um, that we were really happy that we did. On the left picture, you can see the dark floors. That was a, a, a nice design element that we did, even though we had to fix the flooring, um, it really made for a beautiful floor. And um, the heart pine is incredibly hard. And um, it's, it's a very valuable, valuable, valuable um, flooring and uh, we, we really love it. So you have your marble mantle in the drawing room um, and the rest is kind of history. So next, historically marked. So you see a sign there, beautiful blue sign. So that's a, uh, that's a historical marker. So I'm really, really just as happy to say that I built a great relationship with the folks at Chad and, and the historical review team and those guys. Um, it was really important to me um, when my dad got ill later to, to make sure that the work that we put in to save this building was recognized somehow. And I did a lot of work down in Dover to figure out uh, different things in the house to make sure I knew I was doing the right thing. Um, and when I found out about this Delaware historical marker program, I was emphatic about Poplar Hall needs one. So I'll never forget, quick story. I drove down to Dover. I spoke to the representative down there. And this is a long time ago. 
uh, probably, I would say maybe seven, 16, 17 years ago. And I talked about Poplar Hall and the gentleman who was working at the time, he said, Greg, I know Poplar Hall. I've been there. It absolutely has to have, a, it should have a marker. Let's get rolling on the paperwork and let's get this thing going. Of course, I was excited. I was like, wow, that's very, very cool. It kind of solidifies the house as a historic entity and a landmark. Long story short, um, I did a lot of research. It got, it got put up at the time in the historic review to see if it got a marker and it failed. It, they did not approve the marker. And boy, was I pissed. I was pissed. Not because of the work I did, just because I thought it was just ridiculous. Because the team actually said in so many words, uh, the quintessential George Washington didn't, didn't sleep there, or there was not a battle fought there. So I was really bummed and I kind of I kind of pushed it on the rug and I moved on, which is fine. So what I ended up doing was uh, probably five to six years later that a changing of the guard, I, I saw online that uh, a young lady was uh, uncovering and unveiling a sign and I immediately called her up and we put the wheels in motion. I worked to get the funding from the, uh, the governmental funding to pay for that because they are incredibly expensive. Um, and um, we did it. Um, I was excited as anything. Rebecca Shepard, uh, if anyone know her, she was wonderful. Um, I worked, I was lucky enough to work with her to help craft some of the language uh, on the sign, which was very rewarding. And the sign was made. And in return, I was happy to meet them midway. And they said, hey, would you be kind enough to do an unveiling so we can invite some of the dignitaries that put up their budget? Um, and we did that. And um, it was, um, we had Bethany Hall Long was there. We had, um, I think Sally Hansen was there. Um, and we had a lot of, uh, a lot of different people from the, the government in Delaware were there. And it was, it was a wonderful event. Um, wonderful people showed up. We had loads of people and uh, it was a catered event. And I was very happy to commemorate it. Uh, and I was happy to do my part to make sure that uh, the sign was done. And every time I drive by it, I, I get a twinkle in my eye and, and we get people, probably three people daily that stop in front of our house to read the sign. And it is incredibly rewarding to be a part of it. All you Chad folks out there, I think you probably remember this. So uh, as Alex highlighted in the beginning of the conversation, this is how I met Michael and Alex, I, I believe. Um, this is a, uh, I guess it was a, a mechanical style drawing of the facade of Poplar Hall. Um, and it was presented to us in a, in a, a, doc, a set of documents that the team worked on. Um, we, we, I worked with Rebecca. Um, she had a, a, a school team work out of the barns and they, uh, they basically drew all the outbuildings in the house uh, on, on Poplar Hall's uh, property. And um, on the right, we, uh, Dawn and I were invited, which was wonderful, to research day that was held at Buena Vista, if anyone knows that's a wonderful historic home out near 13. And uh, the group did their presentations. Um, it was great to have Poplar Hall involved in that. And um, again, Alex is also a board member of Preservation Delaware. It's a delight to be involved with her and Michael and the rest of the team. And um, it's just, it was just, an, it was just a great experience. And anyone who is interested in dabbling in those kinds of things, reach out to those guys because they will they will lead you in the right direction and Delaware deserves to have it. So I encourage you to do that. Okay, Poplar Hall, a brand. Oh boy, branding is a scary word because it's a marketing advertising word, isn't it? Um, most of the time people think of brands as Coca-Cola, Apple, um, Tesla, Tesla, uh, test the uh, vehicles. Um, but I thought to myself, why couldn't Poplar Hall be a brand in itself? It's a piece of American history. It deserves it. Um, I work in this field. I enjoy these kinds of things. So I worked with the amazing folks at A, B, and C, Aloysius, Butler, and Clark. They're a, an amazing advertising team in Wilmington, the largest one in, in Delaware. And uh, Paul Pomeroy, uh, and his team are just incredible rock stars up there. So I talked to them and, and I worked with them when I was at ING Direct. And I said, hey, uh, I want to brand our, our home and farm and I want to do some big things. And, and we worked on a logo together and they produced this and I fell in love with it. And it's still our logo today. And it's just very, very cool. And it kind of makes you feel warm inside when you have your own logo, I guess. I don't know, maybe it's just me. So I talked about how to make this a brand, how to take the idea of a historic house and make something out of it. So. Um, Quickly, 
Um, when my mother, uh, I lost my mom and I uh, lived my, my dad four years before that. Uh, my mom was uh, Ukrainian. Uh, I am a proud, proud, proud Ukrainian from Chesapeake City. And it's a tough time to be a Ukrainian, but we're strong and we push through. And I wanted to commemorate my mom's heritage. And she always made every single thing handmade. And I'll never forget, she always would, would uh, decorate with handmade greenery. She would cut fresh green for wreaths. And I always remember her joking that when she passes, make sure that you don't put plastic flowers at her gravesite. So the first year she did, when she, we lost her, uh, I invited my family over to make wreaths for grave sites in our barn. And I said, well, look, I got the barn. I, I have loads of greenery. We have magnolia and holly. So I cut a whole bunch and I said, come over on Saturday, we're gonna make the plots. Well, then I thought to myself, well, heck, we got a lot of friends. Everyone likes greenery for, for Christmas. Um, let's invite some people. And then it turned out to be a drinking thing. Then it turned out to be a food thing. So four or five years later, it was one of the coolest things to be involved with if you got the invitation because you would come over, you'd bring a dish, we would all eat, we would drink, and then we'd make wreaths. Um, and when we did that year after year, I'd watch the twinkle in everyone's eye of what it meant to be at a historic house. And our granary barn is, to my knowledge, the oldest standing granary barn in the state of Delaware. It's still incredibly intact. Um, and I put a farm table down the middle and we all as a group, we, we probably had 30, 25, 30 people there. We all made wreaths. We had so much fun. Christmas music was blaring. It's all handmade, natural stuff. And I said to myself, I said to Dawn, my wife, I said, Dawn, if we could capture the glim in their eye at a larger scale, this would be something big and something fun and something that is something that's sought after. So that night I birthed the idea of Let's take the wreath party and put, put that on steroids. And let's make Poplar Hall the home for a European style Christmas market. And that sounds incredibly crazy. And if you came, it is crazy because we had thousands of people show up um, and some things work too well and uh, it's crazy. But anyway, um, the rules of engagement, everything here had to be handmade. Every vendor that you buy, the person bought something had to be there to talk to the customer and show how they made it. We had a musical artist, because I am also in the music business. We had music business uh, singers from Philadelphia. We had a Father Christmas that I, we handmade the costume. It was, no, it was no old Saint Nick. You can get that at uh, Kmart. Uh, this was about a Father European Father Christmas. Um, we had um, woodworkers. We had blacksmiths working on the property. Because it was really about what would people do? The, what would the Boldens do at Poplar Hall in the 18th century just to survive? They would have to make their leather work. They'd have to make their own metal work. They'd have to get their own glass made. They had to make their own bricks. So it was giving that back. And when I created the branding around this, it, it turned into be, it, it was, a, it turned out to be a monster. It was almost unmanageable. Um, it was crazy. Um, it was, it was incredibly cool, uh, but crazy nonetheless. So we have a, a quick marketing piece to show what the first year was like. You're at, you're, it was basically like, you're coming to your old crazy uncle's house who lives up in upstate New York and you go cut down your Christmas tree and you drag it into the house. That's kind of what the feeling we were trying to give for it. So you can see we were, we were putting our asses on the line. This is a European style market. It's at our house. And um, this was, um, we were picked by, uh, after the first year, we were picked by Food and Wine Magazine as one of the 50 best Christmas markets in the whole country. So incredibly rewarding. Um, Yards Brewery was here, which was cool. Their CEO came and poured for everybody. Um, Chef Walter Staub from, um, from the, um, he is the owner and operator of the City Tavern. He has a show on PBS called A Taste of History. As you can see him with the shelf outfit, he came and signed his cookbooks. Um, we, we had a um, Leon's Garden World, uh, Evan McGinnis, who's a close friend of mine. That guy's a rock star, by the way. He, he sold all kinds of holly and winterberry and Christmas trees and um, we had a British car, a British car show. We had a British vintage motorcycle show, which I turned out to be a, a big uh, vintage British motorcycle guy. And you can kind of see it was featured in magazines. A lot of a lot of newspapers wrote about it. I just gave you a little bit of a taste, but you can kind of see what they covered. It was like handmade stuff, you know, good marketing. Uh, there's a picture of the barn, uh, the granary barn. You can see that's a uh, chopped wood is the ceiling. Um, you just can kind of feeling that it's a it's a really a different vibe that we we're trying to put out. You can kind of see what happened. 
So you, uh, you have Scott Gold, who's a Pennsylvania gold woodworker, one of the best in the business, guy's a rock star. Uh, Gene Joseph, killer glass blower from Philly. Uh, Father Christmas, uh, who was a storyteller for kids at the event. British Car Show, Lines Galore. Um, just an amazing set of pottery that, that we had a team make that they sold these um at the uh at the event so people were buying handmade uh colonial style steins um that were just they're just very 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 cool and you can kind of see is that someone took a drone shot uh as it was winding down you can kind of see uh people were everywhere and it was just it was ridiculous but it was incredibly rewarding and i want to talk about this real quick so we received a letter from bethany hall long who's the lieutenant government uh, lieutenant governor of course she still is um, and I'm just going to read that really quick. Dear Greg and Dawn, I am writing to congratulate you on the wonderful concept and development of the European style Christmas park at a historic opera hall in New York. The inaugural event scheduled for December 2nd certainly reflects much planning, originality, and an authenticity that draws visitors looking for the feel of a festive event in old England. As states Lieutenant Governor, I am grateful for the work you and your family have done bringing attention to Delaware's unique history and providing an opportunity for vendors to sell their handcrafted wares. I wish you much success and your continued efforts to bring joy to people's lives as they travel for a time in a true European style market. Sincerely, Bethany Hallong. That meant a lot to my wife and I, um, and we are supporters there. And uh, it's always nice to be recognized the right way. And uh, boy, did she deliver. And I thank her for putting that out there to us. So Poplar Hall is not just a Christmas marketplace. It's also a place that uh, we've had weddings at. Uh, we we had a, a these 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 folks at the top left. Um, they're horse people. They wanted to have the wedding in the back of the house next to our uh, our horses, and uh, so they we we let them do it. it was no problem. And they uh, they designed a great experience over there. It was stunning. It was beautiful. And then on the right was a wedding before that it was uh, was kind of an uh, had a um, an, a Scottish. A bagpiper who is a close friend of mine too. They got married in the back, so we let people mar get married anywhere on the property, and um, we let them choose, and we work around what they want to do. So they, um, Kelly here used uh, Kelly and Dan used the back of the property for the wedding bells. Then they had a, a little happy hour in the granary barn, and then on the uh, on the main lawn, that's where they had the, their dinner. So it was just it was just uh, they they enjoyed taking advantage of Poplar Hall. We enjoyed letting them do it and uh, helping them do it. So uh, as a marketer, you know, uh, once you see promise in the idea of creating a brand around something, now it's it's just feasible to take that to the digital uh, the digital side. So I worked, uh, we filmed a lot here. Uh, I have a couple of close friends in the business. Uh, Tim Miller, if you're watching, he's a, a, a close friend of mine, I've known him forever. And he jumped into a project with me called Historic Living Modern World. It's a, uh, it's a, show, it's a web series that's shown on YouTube and it's filmed mostly at Poplar Hall. But the show um, is about the same tenets of restoring the house is the things that I live by. I only like to buy handmade things when I can. Um, I love helping artisans out. Any, anything that I put on, there's always artisans that will always get a fair shot at, at, at making something as opposed to mass production. And this, this web series is about following me uh, on, on our, because on, I'm pretty much a kind of a Renaissance guy. Uh, motorcycles and we have horses and gardening and you know I'm also in the tech world I'm in the marketing world I'm in the music world so it uh, Tim follows me uh into different projects there's cooking and it's just a pleasure to do the show uh Tim does a great job and I encourage you if you go to at historic living modern world uh, dot YouTube or search in in YouTube you can see the shows like and subscribe I encourage you to um after this presentation if you have some ideas for a show that you'd like to see um just throw a line. We'd love to hear from you, and I'd love to see what you're thinking. So uh, here's Thanks, some. Greg, I'm yeah. so sorry to interrupt, but we we are approaching eight o'clock, so I just okay to give you a heads up. Um, so gotcha. Sorry, All right. <laughs> no problem. Gotcha. So um, let's let's wind this down, and are we going to go for questions, Alex, or not? Yeah, let's try to fit in. So it looks like we do have one in the Q and A. If you wanna, if you wanna wrap things up, and then okay. we can hit. Okay, I'm just gonna one. go through this real quick, and then we'll get to the question. So um, here's the so history loves company. Um, this is where we've come uh, since the beginning. Uh, you can see that the house has a stately, stately view. Uh, horses, and we get a lot of attention to an English English gardens on the property. 
The middle is the um, is the barn, the granary barn, which you can have an event there, and you can see what the uh, the, the the not English garden has become. And the inside of the house has changed immensely. And there it goes. So, what kind of questions do we have? Awesome. So we have a question that was very, very cool. Let me just say, Greg, the photos are beautiful and oh, it's just, it really is amazing what, what you all have done. And I, I'm sad to say that I never made it to the Christmas market. <laughs> well, I have to tell you, so we were so crazy around here that we had to move it to Chesapeake city. Um, and so the, the, we had it for two years here. Then we, um, we picked it up and moved it down there where there's a, a, just a, you know, five times the space. So uh, check it out on um, poplarhall.us. You can learn more about the events. Will do. That sounds great. So the question we have is from uh, Carolyn, and she's asking uh, why Mrs. Belden didn't live at Poplar Hall, and did she have tenants? Yes. So to answer the first question, so um, she was older, so they... Um, they could have lived here. I think there was some talk, but what they did was they did something even better. So they owned a home in Wasset Park. So uh, anyone who's from that area knows it's a pretty wealthy area. And I think that they like the grandeur of Wasset Park. But Mr. Belden, um, because we have loads of people that have lived at Poplar Hall for the next 60, 70 years. They stop in all the time. Every year we get a new, new groups of people that say, I lived in the stone side in 1940. I lived in the brick side in 1980. And so they, different families come all the time. And they always talk about Gail Belden. Mr. Belden would come down here and he would plant flowers on the property. And Mr. and Mrs. Belden would come down and take all the daffodils back to Wilmington to give to all their family and friends. So they use it as a farm to grow stuff. But I don't think that living in a historic house was really up there. Uh, it was really something... Uh, that they wanted to do in case something came bad to the states. They had loads of renters. So they rented, like I said earlier, they rented in both sides for, for years and years and years. And um, the people that come and say hi to us always talk so highly of Mr. Belden. Um, and Mrs. Belden, before she passed, gave us a log. Uh, Mr. Belden kept every log of every cent that he spent on the house. Uh, every, every box, every uh, wire, he notated them on. She gave us this big book of everything he did in the house. Uh, pretty cool. That is amazing. It's great when you when you find documents like that. I feel like they're you don't always find them. Sure. So, um, well, let me. So I'll ask you one last question that I have. I guess if you had to give one piece of advice to a prospective uh, historic house, I guess buyer or owner, uh, what would it be? Um, so I think uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of recommendations that I would give. Um, I I think trusting your gut is a, is a smart thing to do uh, in in a lot of things um, because this house on paper when I found it was most people would say no way would I tackle that. Um, I'm putting this presentation on really so people can know that it is possible to do. If you find something that you like and you like the area and you like where you are. It's absolutely feasible to do it. It's it's well worth it because um, Delaware, unfortunately, has become a plywood, vinyl sided nightmare of houses everywhere. And I get to sleep every single night knowing that a storm is not going to take down my house because of this, the structure that was built a million years ago. So I think tr trusting your gut, um, making sure you have the cash realistically to handle the the updates. Um, whenever you buy a house, just make sure you can get it livable and then make your design changes later. Great, thank you, Greg. That's awesome okay. advice. So let's see, so, oh, well, and there's two. So where will the recording of the program be available? So um, you can find that either on our website or YouTube channel. I will post uh, the link here. Uh, and then we have from an anonymous attendee, you are my second cousin oh. and I am related to the Boldens, so. Wow. I'm their second cousin. Um, I that's what it said, but uh, but okay. maybe, maybe a Bolden relation. Okay, gotcha. Well, listen. Um, um, I'm assuming that my contact information somehow will be available somehow for this or no? Um, let's see. I, I'm sure there's a way that we could. I think we can um, email attendees if if you'd be okay, okay with that. We can yeah, provide I'm, your I'm, contact yeah. info. Uh, yeah, please put my uh, my email address. I think you already have that. Yeah, that to them and. Um, uh, if you're still watching, please reach out because I uh, 
I'd like to think I have a good grasp of what what it what Poplar Hall has from its early roots. But anything that I can share with you that will help you, I'm up to for doing it. That's awesome. So, oh, it's uh, Nan, if you know a Nan. Nan. I don't believe I do. But I, uh, if I do and I'm missing it, I apologize. Okay. All right. So let's see. We'll do, uh, we'll do one last question here. I know, it's, I know it's getting late. But so have you encountered others in Delaware or Maryland who have restored or are restoring historic homes? And is there a network of support for people like that? So to go to the ending question, I think you've already tapped into the network that can help you if, if that's something you want to do. Preservation Delaware is a good conduit to that. Um, and of course, Alex will, I'm sure, make herself available from this, this discussion, as I will too. Um, the questions that you ask are exactly are incredibly valid, and if that's something you're looking to do, um, networking is the most important is the most important thing. And there are networking opportunities. Um, and if we can connect, I can share as many things that I know of. Uh, I mean, Hale Burns House, they, you know, they do a lot of cool things. They're, the ones I've already talked about are very, um, very reticent to to take uh, communication. Awesome. Did I miss that question, honestly, Alex? Was there a question I missed? No, I think you got okay. it. Yeah, no, okay. that's, and, and it's totally true. Yeah, if, you know, if you just Google Preservation Delaware, you'll find our website. Um, contact information is there, um, and that's an easy way to get in touch with, with all of us. And, and like Greg said, you know, we, there's a great network. Um, if, if we don't know, you know, the answer to a question, I'm sure we know somebody we can put you in touch with. So, Preservation Dollars website's, I would say, a great resource. I did want to uh, say one thing that I missed um, on um, Carolyn's uh, question. I think it was Carolyn, if I'm not mistaken. Um, talking about what are the things to, to, to remember is um, one thing that I failed to do, and I always kick myself in the butt for not doing was, is because my father and I did all the work on the house, we didn't get any type of tax breaks at all. We've never received any type of fund, alternative funding. Um, and, you know, that is there also. If you, if you research that and you go to the Preservation Delaware, I know there's some ups and downs with, with funding, but there are ways to get tax breaks um, and, and kind of some buffer areas to make things feasible. And if that can make the difference to put you in a house like this, uh, you'd be a fool not to take advantage of it. That's great advice. Yeah, because it's, you know, yeah, I feel like it's something that's easy to to overlook or not think about when you're when you're thinking about everything else that that goes into to buying and, and restoring a historic home. So you're totally right. Well, Greg, thank you again so much. This you're was welcome. fantastic. We're we've gotten so many um, notes in the chat just saying thank you and that it was a wonderful presentation. So um, I wanted to make sure you knew that and uh, to all of our attendees that we have on now, like I said, Preservation Delaware's website's a great resource. Um, you can go there to look for more information about upcoming events like this one. Um, we've got a webinar coming up in July. That's a follow-up panel discussion to our women's history webinar that we did in May. Um, so we're looking forward to that. And we have also got our annual conference coming up in October. Um, there's a call for presentations that's live. So if you have any ideas on a presentation you'd like to submit, you can find that on our website as well. So again, Greg, thank you so much for your time. Um, You're very it was welcome. great to have you. Thank, thank, thank you. you to everybody for attending. Have a nice summer, guys. Thank you again. Thanks. Have a great night, everyone.